very pragmatic, utilitarian, utilitarian learners. They want to get something for the time they spend in your classrooms. We said in the United States, they use you like they use their checking books, checking accounts, not their savings accounts. They want to get something out of it now. So they're learning for the new skills, the new knowledge to move from one role in life to the other. And the primary transitions that came out in our study were those that dealt with careers. Who provides lifelong learning? There are a number of providers. You've got colleges and universities, and that's what I'll focus on. But there are also training companies throughout the United States, and I'm sure here in Armenia. Training companies, private sector groups that come in and say, come over here, we'll teach you computer skills in eight weeks. We'll teach you uh, uh, health-related skills for becoming a better health assistant or physical, a physician's assistant in, in you know, six months. So we have training companies. We have professional associations. Professional associations in the United States are really created to provide training to their membership. Um, we have businesses. Businesses all have HR directors. Everybody know about HR directors here? They are in charge of education and training of their workforce. However, many of them now are, are, key, are tying in with, with uh, colleges and universities to do what they are really not naturally created to do, and that is to educate. We have government agencies. They sometimes provide their own preparation for their, for their employees. And we have community organizations and NGOs. A lot of NGOs here in, the, in Armenia, I learned, conduct education and training. Um, the formats that they use in, in lifelong learning can be both classroom and online. And, and I have some wonderful uh, statistics to share with you that will continue what um, Anna Lee spoke about earlier. Let me tell you something else, how important this might be in the United States. Many people don't know this, and I'm, I'm projecting that it might even be true someday here in Armenia. We have, in the United States, 20 million undergraduate and graduate students. That's our population in higher education. 40% are over the age of 25. Can you believe that? For almost half, if you, if you really counted unduplicated headcount over a 12-month period of time, half of students in colleges and universities in the United States are over the age of 25. That's not counting the other 20 million who are in non-credit programs offered by colleges and universities. So higher education in the United States is adult education, so to speak. That's how far we've come in recognizing how important an educated workforce is in enabling the United States to move on in this very difficult uh, economic times. What does that 40% of adults in credit programs, what do they look like? No surprise. The majority female, 65% of them are female. Well, I notice that's kind of true, Bruce, at uh, AUA as well. We have many, many females moving on. The median age is 35. That 40% up there of people 25 and older, their median age is 35. They're married. They're working full time. I want to say only 60% are looking for degrees. 40% want courses, certificate programs, licensing programs, and other modular uh, instructional activities. That's why we say the United States has created a new face for higher education. No one would project or imagine that we look like this. So the options for a, re a student returning to higher education include degrees. We have many, many adults in degrees, but it's only 60 percent. Did you know that we have 38 million adults in the United States who began but did not finish their undergraduate degrees. Let's say 40 million. That's a huge number. Do you think our government is concerned that so many people have some credits but not a full degree? Of course. We have incentives in every, probably at least half of our states, incentivizing the colleges and universities to bring these people back uh, motivate them to come back to finish their degrees. Why? 
so the states in which they live can benefit from a more educated workforce. It's a very, very important goal in the United States. They're coming back for a second time to finish what they didn't finish at the first time. In fact, I think uh, maybe uh, Judd or someone said, <sighs> The number of students that we have in undergraduate programs that finish in six years is only 50%. Only half of American undergraduates finish in six years. What do you think the other 50% do later? When they know what they want, when they've entered their families, when they've gone into the workforce and they realize they can't make it without further education, they come back. So they make up our adult learning marketplace. There are certificates. Many adults come back to school already possessing certificates, already possessing degrees. Why are they coming back? They can't stand still in their occupations. And they say, don't give me a degree. Could I have a half a year or a year or maybe three courses in this specialized topic so I can share that with my company and move up the ranks? Certificates are very, very popular. There are licensing programs. You can't be in the medical fields or some of our teaching fields without advancing through licensing programs. There are individual courses. Many adults come back for a series of courses, let's say technical writing, computer technology. And they don't need a degree, they don't want a certificate, but we open the doors for them because they need those, those particular skills to move on. Now, in the non-degree programs, remember the other 20 million in colleges and universities, these are short-term modular compressed programs. Most of them in colleges and universities deal with career and professional development. And then there are partnerships, as I said early, with business, government, and other organizations, which is something definitely AUA should do much more of in terms of helping our companies in Armenia prepare the workforce to meet the challenges of change which certainly will come about as you compete more and more with other entities. Um, for example, VivaCell, Synopsys have tons of employees that can't stay still. And now I'm going to uh, extend what Anna Lee talked about earlier, and it's funny for the overlap, but I felt strongly that what she was saying was absolutely on target. Let me tell you about the effect of technology on lifelong learning today. 10% of those 20 million students in colleges today take all their courses online. They are in online degree programs, essentially. And most of them are over the age of 25. They are lifelong learners. 10%, the projection that in five years it'll be up to 15%. Why? Did you read their characteristics earlier? They're busy. They're working, they have families, they have children, and they can't make it to the campus gates three nights a week, two nights a week, and spend time only in the classroom. They need flexibility, convenience, and efficiency. So we've got 10% of 2 million, that's 20 million, that's 2 million. And then we've got 20% of all students of any age that take one or more online courses in a single term. Now, there are some universities I deal with that limit the number of online programs, courses that traditional age students can take. Why? You can only take one this semester. You can only take two that semester. Why? If they did limit them, the traditional age, the 18-year-old, the 20-year-old would flock to the online courses. So this is going to be a, a big debate in the future. There's no end in sight, I think, in the rise of online education in the United States. It's not going to be everything, every, it's not going to take all of it, but it's going, to, it's going to be a huge share in the next decade or two. We're going to, and universities see it as an incredible um, technique for extending their reach. For example, as Judd told me earlier, I think yesterday, the UC system itself, because of the overload of students and the limited and constraint on budget, is considering dozens of courses in the first and second year to offer online. Will that be highly appealing to even the 18-year-old arriving from high school? You bet. I thought you'd enjoy this slide. Most people I show it to, though you may not be relating to it entirely here in Armenia, it does say a few things. This was an overview I saw recently, and it's talking about tech-savvy kids. And they interviewed mothers 
who had children two to three eight years in age. And the mother said, how many mother, what percent of the mother said, my two or three year old can operate a computer mouse? 69%. Turn a computer on and off? 63%. Play a basic game? 58%. Make a mobile telephone call? 28%. Open a web browser? 25%. What do you think these children are going to look like in, when they're 10, when they're 15, when they're 18 and they're coming to college? Now, those numbers may not be that high here in Armenia, but they shortly will be. He, uh, someone else said earlier about lifetime job attainment, which also connects itself to the need for lifelong education. We will have 10.8 jobs over a lifetime. You can't move from one job to another without education and training. So this even promotes the urgency of providing programs that people can enroll in to make those successful job changes. The average time we're with any one employer is three and a half years now. We keep changing new employers, new skills. And only 28% of employees have been with a single employer for 10 years or more. Remember that gold watch you would get at the end of your career? No longer true. People don't stay long enough to get them. Um, I think you will see this here in, in Armenia in time. So we say that lifelong learning has become the new normal for higher education. It's becoming the cornerstone of the education system. Why? Half of the students are over the traditional age. Half of our students are over the age of 25. Colleges and universities need to focus on both the young and the adult. It presents incredibly wonderful expanding and opportunities for colleges and universities. Doing things for new communities, doing things for new ethnic groups, doing things for new demographics that they were never able to do with requiring, uh, you know, with focusing only on the traditional age po uh, population. Powering the workforce, so important today. And the expansion of traditional degree credit, credit offerings with adult continuing and executive education programs. What we're saying here is, the adults don't want it the same way. My job in the United States is to do market research for colleges and universities that say, how can we serve the lifelong learner better? Well, I'm working with a university in Maine now, and they, they really don't like the answer too much. The answer is, cut your courses from 15 weeks to 8 weeks. Adults like to come to campus, but not for 15 weeks, two nights a a week and it's too long, it's too laborious, so now let's go to eight weeks, let's make it more compressed so that they can get out earlier. We have to tell them that you cannot offer online, you can't offer classroom courses only. You've got to combine some classroom with online and hybrid. Hybrid is where a course is sometimes part of it is online and part of it is in a classroom. So um, the expansion to this market requires colleges to act differently. Many of our colleges don't have to act differently. Harvard College doesn't have to offer eight-week courses, and it doesn't have to offer online courses in Harvard College where they have 10,000 students. However, we have Harvard Extension. That's for the older student. Did you know that? Harvard College, the highly selective college with maybe 10,000 students, um, is very traditional. They can be traditional. They can have more people that want to enter than they can take. However, on the other side of the campus, we have our Harvard Extension, which has 14,000 students, adult students, who are taking shorter courses, taking some online courses, and doing things in new and innovative ways. Um, OK, moving on. I wanted to note and give you examples of two efforts here at AUA, and it was before I created these, Bruce, and, and how to before yesterday's trip to the Terpangian Rural Development Program, as a nice example here at AUA in lifelong learning. The Terpangian Rural Development Program, if you don't know about it, is to promote economic growth and development in rural Armenia. It's helping to improve the lives of families through developing businesses and economic opportunities through education with select number of people who want to be engaged in such operations. Uh, yesterday we went out and we saw uh, an example of three businesses. And I get, to make it clear, these communities, uh, there will be individuals who will 
apply to the program to get the education and training to start a small business in their community. Yesterday we went to a bakery, we went to a sanitary paper processing company, and we heard from someone who was creating new sports equipment in a, in a new way. And so what a wonderful way of improving the skills of, of a workforce in rural communities which is badly needed here. We need to extend this throughout the country because if you drive to the rural communities, they do need help in, in getting individuals equipped to start little businesses, to run operations that people need. And that's what the Tapanjian Rural Development Program does, an excellent example. Um, and then I want to point to extension. We have an extension program here. Um, do you know how many, we, well, let me tell you about this extension program. While we have 400 graduate students here at AUA on a yearly basis, how many students do we serve in extension? 1,200. So we ser serve four times as many adult students in extension as we do graduate students. So, so we're well on our way in providing lifelong learning, but we're only touching the service. In the UC system, correct me if I'm wrong, Judd, um, they have as many students in continuing education extension efforts within the UC students as they have in the traditional part. So um, extension here at AUA interfaces with the community, offers quality courses, and helps adults gain the skills they need in, in, the, in the areas cited above. A very important function. And these are some of the things they do. Just a, a you know, notice managerial training, that's in business. The GMAT and math is to prepare you for uh, probably English speaking, uh, for uh, uh, graduate programs. And English writing, and there will probably be a lot of uh, computer skills training as well, so there's a wide variety. I also want to mention at this time um, Armenian Virtual College. Armenian Virtual College, how many people know what it is? Okay, it's online courses in English, French, Spanish, and Russian in history, culture, language, and one other topic I, misses, I forgot. What is it? Culture. Yes, culture. And so, is that a way for lifelong learning? Sure. Guess, guess why it's professional development? We have NGOs taking those courses. Why? They're coming here for their jobs with, through some NGO operation, and they've got to know about our history, our culture, our language. Wonderful. We have students in the United States who take these courses and want to get credit in their universities to move on. Uh, with their programs, and we're working on uh, the accreditation of them right now. So another good example already here in Armenia of, um, of uh, professional development. I tried to find materials on what the, the Republic of Armenia and the Ministry of Education says about adult education, and I came across the seventh annual Adult Education Week. So there are things happened here. And there are some reports I've read that says we want to do more with lifelong learning. We want to do more with continuing education. I don't know what the actual concrete steps are, but the hearts and minds are in going in the right direction. So this is a whole host of activities in Adult Education Week. So I want to end with this final slide that says, what do we do next? And that's the opening for your questions, I hope. But I want to make a couple of comments before you, you ask. Um, I think a country where human resources considered to be the primary wealth of the country, do you understand that? In Armenia, your human resources are your primary wealth. We don't have oil. We don't have a lot of other natural resources. What we have are bright, talented, uh, people. So we have human capital and we got to keep investing in that human capital because that will affect our economic growth. Uh, in this economy, the human resources are even more and more important in making it. And combined with that, someone said it earlier and I found the same statistic, 99 point plus percent of Armenians are literate. We have probably one of the highest literacy rates in the world and we are a, a very talented group of people. So I predict that colleges and universities will say, our job does not end because you're age 24 or 25. Our job continues 
until uh, you, you, your professional and, and career lives have been fulfilled and you're ready on for a final transition some, to someplace else. But we're with you for those next, what, 40 years? Because you can't stay still. You can't continue to grow without further education. So I would enjoy any questions you might have. Thank you. Oh, good. Carol? Yes. Uh, some years ago, uh, one of the acting presidents of the American University of Beirut said the biggest problem of education in the Arab world uh. is a problem of re-education. Uh, here in Armenia, I think that applies much more than it applied in those days in the Arab world because we had a full societal transformation for which the appropriate re-education did not occur for the last 20 years. This re-education of the people who were in their 40s, 50s yes. and who were still part of the workforce pushed a lot of those at that generation towards Russia or towards poverty because of the absence of re-education. Sorry for this statement. Good. That's not a question, but it's an excellent statement. Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. As an uh, AUA alumni, I would like to ask the following. Um, you know that Armenia is facing uh, two uh, biggest problems, a uh, very small uh, labor market uh, and uh, definitely surplus of professionals and educated people and brain drain. So are there courses which are teaching how to market ourselves? How to... Um, how to market the university program? No, no, no. no, no. The how to, how to, uh, to teach how to market the graduates yes. themselves how to present our knowledge appropriately for uh, our government, our businesses, and... Um, how to present yourself with the skills you have as an yes, AUA and graduate. and to be employed, because there are a lot of people who are employed and very well, uh, I mean, uh, they are very well, very well educated, but they cannot get jobs just because um, of uh, these poor marketing issues. It, because the opportunities are there? The but it's the match between what you have to yes. offer and getting to that location. That, uh, to analyze the uh, needs uh, of the market and, and to present uh, right. appropriately the education level right. to meet the needs of the market. That's okay, the well that is certainly a, a legitimate function for AUA. We, we must produce good graduates, but we must also think about career placement, and I would hope we do that. I don't have the answer on what the university could do, but certainly career placement is a major uh, operation in most graduate schools. Bruce, do you want to say something about that? And, and I completely agree that it would be a good idea to expand those kinds of programs in the future. Yes, because somebody who's edu been educated at AUA with the talents and the skills you have, even though may, there may be limited job opportunities, you know, even through internships, that might be an idea, maybe through your course of study, I know that many of you are already working. So you are, you're already engaged, but those who are not and will be searching for jobs, internships, uh, associations during the summer hours with business and industries or government agencies is some way to connect you early. You know, in the United States, internships have gone off the wall. All students want internships. Why? They get connected to their to em their employment. Most students in graduate school, the the year the summer between their two years, they take an internship at the company that will offer them the job. So that might be an excellent idea between the first and second year of any AUA program. Yes. You have to be a bit uh, short in question and answer because uh, we have a lot of program, as you all know, coming uh, at 4 o'clock. So please go. Yes. 
Uh, you mentioned that um, lifelong learning can be formal. Yes. Uh, I assume that the role of the teacher uh, changes to LL uh, teacher, lifelong learner teacher. How do you see uh, this changing process in Armenia? I mean, the role of the teacher changes uh, because... In formal... No, you, you said that lifelong learning can be formal. That yes. means universities, higher education universities, can give uh, the competencies uh, that our students need right. for this um, digital world, right. uh, for this economy. Uh, I mean, uh, the changes. How do you see this um, process of changes of the role of teachers okay. Good question. in Be Armenia? Because I've, we've had this problem in the United States for years. Everyone just says, oh, to teach an adult. I don't know how to teach them. They're older, they're, they're experienced, and there's no real reason for any differences because our undergraduates, the undergraduates here are working, they've been out in, they've been in military probably, they've done a lot of things. So there really isn't any different uh, a pedagogy in teaching younger and older, I think. Yes, an older person has experience. The older person is harder to teach, that's one thing. Faculty have to be much better in teaching adult learners than they do an 18-year-old. Adult learners ask questions, they participate. We once did a study at the College Board about how faculty uh, compare younger students to their older students in their classroom. You have to remember that some of these older students are there day long and some of the younger students are in the evening. So we asked the faculty, how do you compare the younger and the older? And they said, we prefer the older. Why? It brings back reciprocity to the classroom. They ask questions, they're engaged, they bring in experience, and they aim for the higher grades. So I don't think there's any methodology differences. I think it's a matter of attitude. You can expect more from the adults. They can teach the younger people, the younger students can teach the older people. Sometimes, I, I forgot to mention that, in the States we do have a lot of mixed classrooms because not all younger people study during the day. Some of them go in the evening. Lots of older students who are part-time workers or who are out of jobs go during the day. So we have a lot of mixture and they, the one thing that's good about it, they learn from one another.